you very much, everyone, for joining this public lecture. And this is the first public lecture of the Afghanistan Research Initiative, an initiative that is funded by the International Development Research Center and the Aga Khan Foundation Canada. And the Afghanistan Research Initiative is part of the Graduate School of Development, the University of Central Asia, which is a, a regional university with campuses and operations in Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, and we also have programs in Afghanistan. I will say more about our institution. You can look it up on the email. Now, the Afghanistan Research Initiative is something that was launched in 2020 uh, with the express purpose after the very unfortunate political changes in Afghanistan to help sustain research and capacity gains made over the last decade or so uh, during the Republic uh, to make sure that knowledge isn't lost and that knowledge is created. This is particularly important in view of the very disastrous state that universities have found themselves in the country. We're very fortunate to have two speakers. I know them both from visiting Kabul multiple times, and especially Omar, whom we would always sit down and have coffee at the um, uh, good old Serena Hotel. Uh, I'll begin with Omar, who is a, he now teaches at the University of Paris, uh, Pantheon Sorbonne, which is kind of the, the cool bit of the university because it's in the Latin Quarter in these beautiful buildings. And uh, Omar has a Ph. Omar has a PhD in uh, in economics from the uh, from Bordeaux, and he uh, was a former World Bank country economist, and he's done an awful lot of work in Afghanistan, and he's also work, he's also the executive director of the Biruni Institute. Biruni Institute, and he's one of the best economists in the country. And Google him, you'll see there's lots of interesting publications. Lutfi uh, is also somebody I met in, uh, in Afghanistan. He's the head of research at the Biruni Institute, but he used to be a senior policy advisor at the Ministry of the Economy in Afghanistan. He was a consultant uh, at the World Bank. And uh, professor of Economics at the American University of Afghanistan, a pretty wonderful institution that, remark unfortunately, had to uh, shut down. Um, this session is going to, this lecture, is this event is going to be held, is, is going to be for one hour. Um, we encourage you to send questions on chat or pick up your hand. And uh, I if if some if one of the attendees has already picked up their hands, let me know. I can't see you. Um, so 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 we will start. The topic is a very, very interesting one, which is surviving the crisis of social economic assessment of the middle class in Kabul. Whenever we talk about Afghanistan and poverty, we always think about the rural population. One of the new things that happened in Afghanistan is uh, urban poverty, and especially urban poverty amongst professional and middle classes. And this is very unusual. Uh, it's sometimes, it turns out to be paradoxical that perhaps sometimes it's easier to cope with poverty in the countryside where you can stretch out uh, your bread a little bit more, but when you are in the urban areas, you have a very big problem. This is something that has not been researched, and um, this is something that has not been researched, and I think that we are very, very lucky to see this research uh, presented to us, and what is interesting about this research, and it's typical of the research that we do at the Afghanistan Research Initiative, is based on empirical evidence and surveys that were conducted in the country. So we're generating new knowledge. Welcome, and Omar, 
please, it's your turn. Thank you, Dr. Krashenko. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and thank you for convening this uh, this webinar uh, so that we can present the results of this uh, uh, survey. Uh, let me share my screen. Um, uh, we have prepared uh, uh, a presentation. Um, or perhaps I could. It came up. Yeah, it's up. Okay. Okay. Um, so, so this is a survey uh, that we uh, launched uh, last year uh, from uh, between May and July 2023 with uh, 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 with a research grant from the ARI um, and. Uh, uh, I will uh, start off with presenting. Uh, uh, a part of the results, and then Dr. Lutfi Rahimi will, will, will proceed next. Uh, so just a little bit to set the, 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 the context, uh, uh, even prior to the Taliban's takeover uh, of Kabul uh, back in August uh, 2021, the Afghan economy was already set at a lower growth path. Uh, uh, Afghanistan had experienced a very strong economic growth of about 9 to 10% per year uh, between 2001 until the start of the security transition in 2011 or 2012. But then right after the security transition, which was basically the withdrawal of uh, about 120,000 NATO troops, NATO and US troops from Afghanistan, economic growth fell to even below 2% per year. And it wasn't even uh, enough to, um, uh, to offset the population growth. So basically per capita income was declining uh, since uh, 2014, at the end of the security transition. And um, poverty at the same time uh, increased uh, to about 50% uh, in 2016 um, and, and slightly moderated to about 45% uh, to, uh, in uh, 2019, just prior to the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. So the, uh, the uh, economic growth was already slowing down even prior to the um, Taliban's takeover. But what happened with uh, Taliban's takeover in uh, August 2021 was that there was a fundamental institutional changes that, that occurred. Uh, and there was a sudden transition away from democratic institutions to, an, to autocratic institutions. Uh, the 2004 constitution was dissolved. Uh, uh, people were deprived from the very basic human rights and especially uh, the women's right uh, for work and education, and it continues to be the same. Uh, so there was a sudden uh, um, uh, change in the institutional context and basic rights in the country. And at the same time with these changes um, and the collapse of the uh, former government of the Republic, uh, uh, Islamic Republic of Afghanistan, there was a, a humanitarian crisis that uh, uh, emerged in the country. Um, uh, about 26 million people were in need of uh, humanitarian assistance, according to the UN, uh, back in early uh, 2023. And uh, about um, 6 million people were in uh, emergency needs of humanitarian assistance, according to the UN. Um, and with the uh, Taliban's takeover of Kabul, uh, there was significant um, uh, economic shock. Um, uh, GDP shrunk by about $5 billion just within a few months, uh, according to the UNDP, and millions of jobs were vanished, uh, particularly in the public sector, and especially in Kabul city, where most of these uh, positions um, were uh, concentrated in, in, in Kabul city. Um, now, now, when we think about the impact of such a strong economic shock on uh, the people, 
Um, here we, 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 we could consider uh, a slightly different impact for the rural population and for the urban population. While uh, both the urban and the rural populations, um, they have their own vulnerabilities. Um, uh, for instance, the rural um, is more vulnerable to climatic and weather shocks, uh, especially shocks in the agriculture sector. But they're but they're expected to be less uh, vulnerable to uh, shocks in non-agriculture sectors. Uh, and uh, to um, changes in the urban labor markets, uh, which was actually the case with the with the with this political uh, collapse in August 2021, um, and uh, the rural all also tend to develop over the years a diverse set of insurance mechanisms that help them to cope with uh, the uh, um, economic shocks, while uh, urban population, especially the middle income who are often less exposed to smaller idiosyncratic economic shocks. But when they face uh, um, uh, a, sub, uh, uh, a great uh, unexpected economic shock, then they're less, uh, less able to adapt. So this was sort of the starting point for this research where we uh, uh, try to understand uh, the impact of this political crisis, uh, of the political collapse of uh, in in, uh, two, uh, in 2021 on, on Kabul's middle income, which is less often uh, studied uh, and uh, less focused on. So uh, in this uh, study, we tried to uh, uh, to look uh, at the socioeconomic situation of the urban and educated middle class in Kabul. We tried to uh, cover uh, uh, diverse uh, uh, um, areas of the socioeconomic status of, of the middle income, like employment, consumption, uh, saving patterns, but also, uh, and I think this is uh, one of the innovative things that we try to do with the surveys, is not to just focus on economic aspects, but also to try to understand the mental health uh, situation and the perceptions of people uh, about their basic rights, perceptions on migration and so forth. Um, um, and, and basically we, we, we tried to understand how uh, Kabul's urban middle income uh, coped with this radical institutional change uh, and uh, economic shock that uh, took place uh, with the Taliban's takeover of Kabul in August uh, 2021. And here we used a mix of quantitative and qualitative uh, surveys. Um, and just to tell more about the uh, our methodology uh, for this survey, so we surveyed uh, nearly 300 uh, individuals in Kabul city, um, or more specifically 294 individuals. Um, and we complemented uh, this with uh, some semi-structured interviews uh, with uh, 24 participants to gain much more um, uh, a bit of more qualitative information uh, on 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 people's uh, uh, socioeconomic uh, challenges. So basically, our target population um, in this survey was the uh, uh, educated and urban middle income residents of Kabul uh, who were uh, uh, economically active prior to the twenty twenty one crisis. So we tried to target. Uh, those uh, segments of the urban population in Kabul who were already considered sort of middle income earners. So we did not include uh, the very poor segments of the population or the very rich, but we focused on those who were uh, somewhat educated. Uh, and, and you'll see that most of them had a higher uh, education degrees, but were also uh, economically active. So most of our participants had uh, several years of experience working in various sectors in not only just in private sector, but in public sector with international institutions and also in military. Um, and the way that we tried to uh, proceed in the survey is that we collected information not only about their current socioeconomic status, uh, meaning 
their situation back in July 2023. But we tried to also gain information in a comparative manner so that they would compare their current situation to us with their situation two years ago so that we can gain a grasp of uh, what sort of changes happened between this two year uh, time frame. Now, most of you are aware that it's very difficult to actually get uh, point estimates uh, from respondents about uh, time periods that are very far away in the past because people cannot recall. So instead of us asking uh, the participants that uh, what was or how much was your consumption two years ago, we, we instead ask them how they compare their current levels of consumption with that in two years ago. Because uh, when you ask people to compare um, their situations in some variables between two time frames, they can give some um, uh, somewhat uh, good estimates of a comparison rather than giving you some point estimates. So we hope that with this approach, we were able to actually reduce this recalling error uh, in the survey. Um, now, you all know that there are huge security risks for doing uh, surveys, and especially for random surveys where the enumerators and surveyors have to go to certain areas on a random basis or from a list frame. And this wasn't just feasible for us uh, to do, um, uh, especially when you are not considered to be pro-Taliban. Uh, so, uh, so there are huge security and political risks. And especially when you do surveys that have very um, narrowly defined target population, which was in our case, uh, you cannot do that without having a sample frame, uh, meaning a list of all or most of the tar target population so that you could draw the random sample. So a uh, random sample was basically not feasible for us. Uh, and instead we went uh, to, do, uh, to consider a snowball sampling which is basically where you, you start off with, uh, with a few uh, individuals and then you ask each individual or each participant to introduce other participants for the survey from their circles of friends or related or networks of their uh, acquaintances. Um, and then you grow the sample so forth. So this snowball sampling helped us to actually minimize security risks, but also establish an element of trust. Because if you walk onto a, to a random person introducing yourself that you're doing this survey, he's not going to disclose you critical information, especially if there are security risks uh, uh, that are there. Uh, and uh, we had uh, several people in our population, in our uh, sample, where they had worked in the security sector, either with the government or with, uh, the, with the international community. So this snowball sampling helped us to establish also this element of trust so that we could uh, get uh, more frank answers uh, from our participants. But of course, uh, although this method of snowball sampling is widely used in, in social science research, in business research, but still it's it's subject to some sample bias and we are cognizant of that. And of course we cannot uh, uh, claim that the results can be representative of the total population. Um, um, for instance, we, 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 we do not claim that the results would uh, replicate the situation for all urban population in all urban cities in Afghanistan. So it's uh, strictly to Kabul and most of the results give, uh, but but we do have a feeling that uh, the uh, that the sample that we selected uh, were diverse as possible to uh, uh, to um, uh, to show the um, the democratic uh, the, uh, demographic context in Kabul city. So with this, uh, um, so so this is just a glimpse of the um, um, of our um, of the socioeconomic uh, status of our sample. So most of the uh, uh, most of the participants were uh, aged between. 25 years old to uh, 55 years. So as you can see, they were uh, economically active. Uh, uh, 
uh, a big share of our participants had a, um, a higher education. Um, so more than 50% of them with a bachelor's degree. Uh, about 22% uh, of our participants were female. So we ensured to capture um, uh, a good number of female and women in our sample. And uh, uh, um, uh, most of the, uh, and the average professional experience in our working, in our sample was about 10 years. Uh, so, so we, uh, so we were able to actually uh, capture a sample that were uh, economically active prior to the Taliban's takeover. So now the, the results, um, uh, we uh, found that 43% of our participants were identified as unemployed um, at the time of the survey, which was in July, 2023. But this rate was actually only 4% 4, 4 in July uh, 2021. So basically, the unemployment uh, rate within our sample increased by about 50%. Um, and, and you can see this on, on the graphs. On the left side, we have the July 2021. And on the right-hand side, we have the results for July 2023. And uh, this increase in in unemployment rate was uh, was both among men and women, um, but we of course do see a considerable increase among men, of course. Uh, uh, on the uh, household income, uh, the share of households earning a monthly income of less than 25,000 Afghanis, which was just less than about $280, increased by 60 percentage points over the course of the past two years. Meaning that back in uh, 2021, only 24% uh, of, uh, uh, of the survey participants uh, declared that they had an income of less than 25,000 uh, Afghanis, but this rate actually increased to 84% uh, in July 23, where 84% of our survey participants uh, declared that they were earning an income of less than $25,000. And, and most of you who have been to Afghanistan, I mean, $25,000 is not... Um, uh, is, uh, is is not something that would uh, provide you with a uh, with a satisfactory um, uh, with an adequate life. Um, but then the share of those other um, uh, segments which were earning higher levels of income that substantially reduced. So so you do see a significant economic impact of this political uh, crisis on households income where the share of those who were earning less have considerably increased. Um, on household debt, we uh, see that the share of indebted households increased from 30% uh, back in uh, 2021 to 67% in 2023. Uh, so basically suggesting that the share doubled over the course of the past two years. So not only the average level of household debt increase, but you do also see more and more number of households starting to borrow. Uh, on household consumption, uh, we found that uh, spending not only on food, but also non-food uh, items um, uh, decreased substantially over the past uh, two years. So we asked the, the, the respondents uh, how they compared their current spending on food items uh, with, uh, uh, with that in July, 2021. So 47% of the uh, households responded that they consumed substantially less on food items compared to two years ago. Um, while those who say that their consumption levels remained the same or they were consuming relatively more were only try, uh, uh, tiny fractions among uh, our survey participants. And you can also see that spending on non-food items has also increased uh, the, the graph on the right-hand side. There was perhaps, uh, um, uh, uh, not an increase, but uh, uh, 
uh, a level, uh, somewhat a similar level of spending on communication expenditures. And it makes sense that people, if when they're deprived of other economic activities, then they tend to perhaps consume more on communication. Um, but especially on other non-food items, we do see a reduction as well. Um, uh, and uh, we also asked the participants how they uh, how frequently they run into difficulty in meeting their monthly uh, expenses or purchase food uh, ne necessities. Um, um, so 43% um, of the participants in uh, July last year uh, declared that they frequently experienced um, uh, difficulties in meeting their uh, monthly expenses or purchasing food. Um, and only 18% of them declared that they never in, encountered any, any difficulties in meeting their monthly income. But when you compare this with, uh, with uh, two years ago, uh, back then, 77% of the households had declared that they never uh, uh, experienced difficulties in meeting their uh, uh, monthly expenses. So uh, we do see an increase in the frequency of running into uh, in, in meeting uh, the household's monthly expenses uh, now compared to what it was two years ago. So, it, so all these results show that the impact of this political crisis on the Kabul's middle income was much, much uh, significant. Um, uh, on, on various elements. Now, uh, I think this is my last slide and then uh, Dr. Lutfi could resume. So um, we also tried to see uh, the behavior, the, to get sort of an, um, an understanding of the people, of people's trust in, in the banking sector. And uh, uh, we, we see that increasingly lesser proportions of savings is being deposited in commercial banks. So um, uh, last year in July uh, 2023, 96% uh, of our participants say that they um, uh, say that they uh, that they deposited only less than 10% of their savings in commercial banks. However, uh, two years ago. And this was only 45% of households who deposited less than 10% of their um, of their deposits in commercial banks. Um, so back then, I mean, two years ago, uh, uh, the remaining 55% of, of people, uh, they deposited uh, larger shares of savings in the commercial banks, which indicated their trust or confidence in the confident in the banking sector. But uh, last year in uh, to, uh, 2023, only 4% of our participants uh, said that they were that they had deposited more than 10% of their uh, uh, savings in the commercial banks. Um, and I will stop here and Dr. Lutfi will present uh, the next. Uh, thank you, Julia. Should I share my screen? So my screen is visible now. You, yes, yes, perfect. Um, so just to continue, um, the um, second part of the socioeconomic survey, we asked questions about health. Um, so this is uh, general health as well as mental health. Uh, about thirty-five percent of the samples said that they developed a new type of anxiety. Um, or they started taking um, sleeping pills for the first time since August of 2021. And uh, as you can see, this is true in, in the case of male and female participants. Um, what, 
so if we focus on the total number, so 35% of the um, samples say that they started um, taking these, um, the, developed new anxieties and started taking new pills, uh, that's a significant increase and an alarming number. Um, in terms of mental health, um, we use a measure of um, we use a measure um, which is common in clinical um, psychology evaluations, which is a uh, ten item based questionnaire where it's designed to um, kind of detect your depression symptoms and signs of anxiety and try to understand different aspects of it. Um, so we, we, we implement this 10-item um, um, survey and we try to interpret this. Uh, and there are three different categories when you try to clinically interpret this. So one is that uh, you, the person or must be referred for further psychological evaluation. And the second category is that the person could benefit from an early intervention. Uh, and then we have the third, which no referral is needed. <clears throat> so essentially what happens in our sample is that 41% of the sample scores must be referred. And a further 34% uh, of the sample scores that they could benefit from an early intervention. Um, and these are all um, based on recent anxieties and mental health issues that they have developed post-collapse. Um, part of the survey, uh, or another module of the survey, we ask uh, on the five different basic dimensions um, uh, of freedom, or uh, five dimensions of basic freedoms. So those dimensions are um, safety at home, um, rule of law, freedom of expression, individual identity, and property rights. Um, we had to make a decision here on which aspect of basic freedoms to uh, to include because there's a very long list of things, and, and I think these are these five were the most pertinent in in the case of Afghanistan. Uh, we also asked uh, participants how many times their house was searched by the authorities in the last um, two and a half years now, so since August of 2021, uh, about. 88% um, say that their house was searched by the authorities unannounced uh, between two to four times. And about 2% say more than five times, and about 9% of them said that their house was never searched. So that's a massive increase in the number of house searches and you know, their interaction with the authorities. Um, we use a number of questions as proxies. So, for example, resolving disputes to court, we use that as a proxy for rule of law or to understand rule of law. About over 70%, over 70% of participants said um, they will not use the courts in order to resolve any dispute that they have. Whereas 19% said maybe and only 10% said yes. So these are Taliban courts uh, within Kabul, uh, which is um, some sort of, you know, continuation of the previous uh, government um, um, with uh, partial implementation of previous laws and, and current laws anyway. On the freedom of uh, freedom to express religious or political views, uh, that's on the freedom of expression uh, aspect of basic freedoms. Over uh, 80%, so that's 85% of participants said that they do not feel confident they can, that they can express their religious or political views while they're in Congo. And uh, only a small fraction of 4% uh, within the participants said that they are able to do so. And so, so far, um, these are all survey based questions. Um, from now on, um, there's a blend of the result from the survey, but as well as of our findings from interviews and uh, more in depth discussions with 24 participants that we interviewed as part of the survey. 
So one of the questions we begin with, um, we ask, um, well, part of the survey, we already asked, um, how optimistic are you about the future, the economic and political future of the country? So about 82% of participants say that they're not very optimistic. This kind of links to a question that we asked during our interview, which is, um, how was your general experience of the collapse? Uh, the emerging theme from the 24 uh, interviews happened um, as part of this survey is that participants express a deep sense of loss and disillusionment. Uh, even after two years of the collapse, um, they are unable to formulate and articulate what happened and how, how it happened because it was so sudden and fast and it uh, affected almost every aspect of their life that they had known for the last 21 years. Um, so they talk about lack of economic and political optimism about the future. They talk about personal safety. I think this was a big theme um, because um, there is an emerging discussion uh, in the context of Afghanistan that violence has been has has ended. There is no uh, active warfare taking place across the country. But if we try to understand and break down uh, the concept of security, so you have this at two levels where you have violence and active insurgency taking place in a country, but a big aspect of um, that is personal safety and whether you feel safe within the country that you're living. And that kind of links to the rule of law. Most participants that we spoke to, they said they felt no personal safety. And they also felt that there's a shifting public discourse towards more um, Talibanism, which is uh, uh, loosely referred to, uh, you know, less tolerant, uh, more reductionist uh, understandings and interpretations of religion and a specific code and style of uh, society, you know, an appearance of society. They felt that there is increasingly segregation in public spaces and they felt that. Increasing living costs and also shifting demographics with a lot of new uh, families moving into Kabul uh, that are less kind of um, familiar with urban life and you know, uh, existing rules and societal rules in Kabul. So that's a snapshot of what the general experience of the participants as a result of the interview. So part of the interview we ask on um, these interviews, we ask about migration. So a question from the survey itself, uh, where we ask people, given the opportunity, would you leave the country? Uh, over 80, 85%, uh, they say definitely yes. Um, and they, they would leave, whereas only 4% said definitely no. But then um, on a much smaller sample of the interviews, when we ask them um, their, about their attitude towards migration, um, the reasons they include for migration in favor of leaving the country in order of ranking and preference, uh, we find that fear of being prosecuted was ranked uh, the top in, in terms of reasons to leave. Then personal safety, as I mentioned, and then uncertainty of daughters or children's future in, in Afghanistan, uh, loss of individual freedoms, uh, racial and uh, language-based discrimination, then lack of economic opportunities, and then... Uh, fear of a future civil war. So to just mention one of the quotes from these interviews, one of the participants say that uh, any of them referring to the Taliban, they can come and take you the next morning and no one is able to ask why. So this, uh, this is absence of rule of law at its peak and it's very scary. So um, the person goes on to say, I miss sleeping without stress of having to wake up the next morning. Um, so this was the um, kind of snapshot of the attitude towards migration and understanding uh, why people are leaving and, and 
vast number of people have left Afghanistan in the last two and a half years. Um, the, the other theme that we tried to explore as part of um, um, the survey was attitude towards co cooperation. And the reason behind this was to kind of get an understanding of the social tensions and the changes in the demographic, because those are essential um, in terms of, you know, having a uh, personal safety, having peace and a sense of community, which are very important. So we found that perceived intra-group cooperation had increased while that of intergroup kind of declined. What that means is that the groups that you are similar with, that you associate yourself with um, uh, more, you kind of cooperate with them more and then distance yourself from the ones that you don't seem um, to associate yourself with. Uh, and this is uh, consistent with the literature on this um, on this. Um, uh, which on um, this theme, which is cooperation. So often uh, structural changes and breakdowns leads to um, different groups along the different dimensions, kind of dividing themselves and distancing themselves or actually closing themselves to the, to, to the ones that they associate. And those dividing lines during the interview, we ask uh, participants, turns out to be things, you know, the usual suspects, things like ethnicity, language, um, sect, uh, income distribution, uh, neighborhood, and social status. Um, this is important. It's important to note that things like you know income distribution, neighborhood, and social status, because the first three are the usual suspects that you would expect from Afghanistan to um, to kind of emerge, given the country is um, you know full of different ethnic groups and different languages and different sects and so on. But because our survey was targeted on a um, population of economically active, urbanite, middle class, uh, you actually find that there are other emerging themes, you know, within that cooperation, that is income distribution, that's neighborhood, that's social status. Um, and to quote one of them, um, uh, if, you, if you don't attend someone's funeral once and twice, if you don't go to people's houses on Eid and don't take time to invest, uh, these family ties break apart, and this is what happened to us in Kabul. Now, um, now is the time to rekindle those ties. So, essentially, what the person is referring that it, an atomic and nuclear type of life emerged in the last twenty years, slowly started to emerge, uh, um, where people are so busy with jobs and so on um, that kind of old ties were neglected a little bit. Now the majority of these groups lost their, uh, lost their jobs and there is this structural uprooting of the society. Uh, they seem to feel the heat of that, of that period. So these, these are bigger, big research themes that each of them requires a lot of discussion and much more in-depth analysis, whereas we just barely touched the surface um, during the survey. Um, I think this is the last slide for me as well. Um, so the last thing we talk or we ask the um, interviewers, interviewees is about social stigma. The idea was that if you lose your job and if you see so many changes happening, how do you feel or, and how is, the, uh, is, is there a stigma attached to it? You know? um, Several different things were emerged um, as part of these discussions. So um, it's more linked to two two emerging themes. So if you could uh, if you could sum this up broadly, it would be two things. One, the demographic change that has happened in Kabul, and the demographic change has had an impact. So. Uh, that being social norms and etiquettes changing, you know, city culture changing. Uh, and then the other aspect of um, social stigma would be an individual impact on the person. And that individual impact would be things like um, people feeling isolated, people having low self-esteem or unable to socialize themselves. Um, and, and the last point, you know, verbal or physical abuse and being too liberal uh, is also linked to the first level, which is, you know, at the society level. 
Um, so there are evidences of uh, social stigma at a social, at a society level and individual level. Um, I think that's the last slide. So these are the findings of the survey. Um, thank you very much. I think I'm going to stop here. Well, thank you very, very much for uh, a, a really interesting, a very, very interesting presentation. There are things, you know, we, we have certain images about what, certain ideas about what things are, you know, what things are going on. For example, the Taliban say that the streets are safe now and you're safe and people feel more insecure. That's a, I think, a sort of totally counterintuitive finding counter to what it is that is being said. So please, can you ask a question uh, or make a comment by raising your hands? I noticed that one participant, Rona, has raised a hand. So you, you can speak or please uh, type a message in the chat. Rona? Hello. Yeah, hi. Please speak. Can, your mic is off. Can you please speak? Yeah. Can you hear now? Yes, of course. Yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, it was uh, very interesting to hear both the Professor Omar and uh, Professor. Uh, they they both talk about the survey and and how a group of people that what they thought about economic situation and all of that this is kind of my frustration here is i i have done lots of survey with the afghani students particularly with the young uh female students in when the education ban uh, the taliban obviously new policy that says that education ban behind grade six and girls are being home I have done survey as well. There's nothing wrong with survey. But my problem with surveys are, and in particular because I have experience with doing survey, it really does not uh, consider like everything. Uh, and we can just randomly say like, yeah, economic situation, political situation, this situation, that situation. But it's really, I'm very frustrated with, with how the way things are going right now with Afghanistan. Um, we simply could say that yes, as a as a researcher, as a, a PhD professor, we could simply just make a report to impress the United Nations or to impress Red Cross or to impress certain things. And I'm doing the same things, to be honest with you. I'm writing a report to say that, oh yeah, things are it's okay. I did a survey. But things are very, very, very difficult on the ground in Afghanistan. Yeah. Um, if we say we, we survey 300 people or 24 people, we are selectively choosing. And, and honestly, Professor Omar already mentioned that these are a group of people that have some education, have some knowledge. But I understand because these people, some knowledge. But if you're really on the ground now, things are really, really in a bad shape. I am in Japan right now uh, studying in ICU. International Christian University, and I, I'm i always speechless. I will not say that, yes, I, I did survey in Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan with uh, some Afghani girls okay. uh, about yeah. education, but I cannot proudly talk about it. Like, yes, I did survey. Yes, we talk about these issues. Things are much, much worse than what we are talking about right now on a Zoom meeting tonight. That's my bottom line. Yeah. And okay. uh, I am not sure how we all... I, I am simply speechless. I am with the meeting. I'm not satisfied that I would say like, okay, this is very good. It's a progress. It's a two PhD people or a master level. And I'm a master too. We can do something. I'm not absolutely satisfied with the way everything is going right now. Okay. Well, uh, okay. You can, you, you made the point. You, you can turn your mic off. But you know, in this world, there is something called the division of labor, and uh, having uh, do, doing research is also part of the broader contestation. I mean, we know the situation is terrible, 
but I think it's extremely interesting to know how it is terrible and how it is expressed in various groups. And let me ask a question in this regard to either uh, probably Omar or maybe Lutfi. If you look at Taliban policies now, because they have no money coming in from anywhere, they have to raise funds domestically. And uh, they're collecting revenues left, right, and center. And one and since you have to raise funds domestically, that means you have to mo promote some kind of economic growth. At one point, do you, is there a possibility that at some point the uh, imperative of spurring entrepreneurship and spurring the economy in order to collect taxes is going to somehow not well tone down some of the excesses that you're talking about, like visiting people's homes. Because it's very difficult to imagine economic growth under these conditions of fear and instability. But they have no other choice to economic growth because there is no other source of, a, a source of income. Well, if I could uh, just say a few uh, remarks, well, uh, I, I understand the, 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 the frustration that Mrs. Uh, Rona Karimi had. I mean, I, I understand that and that's part of, and, and it's, it's a very difficult time and situation for the, the, the Afghan women, of course. Uh, uh, and in the report, we, we, we tried to actually cover all these various aspects of life in, in Kabul. Uh, um, uh, from economic activities to uh, the social status to mental health and, and so far. And across all these variables, we, we see a significant deterioration uh, and increase in challenges and difficulties that people are experiencing. And I think um, I, I wasn't sure uh, how come... Um, uh, you could not see the sort of the uh, the alarming results that we were showing. I mean, for me, all these results are actually alarming. Now, of course, we we also try to stick with uh, you know the uh, scientific validity to be neutral as much as possible, but to also stick with the uh, um, the robustness of our method and so forth. And we did our best to actually stick with all these scientific integrity, but also to convey all these uh, alarming results that 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 uh, that we're seeing. And 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 we do think that. Uh, that these results uh, should actually uh, uh, should actually be uh, considered as uh, as a, a very depressed situation among all the participants uh, in uh, in in Kabul. Uh, now, of course, we did not dwell very deep into the very daily life of Afghan women, which I think that was your expectation. But as we said, we are touching all these different themes and then more specific surveys and studies could then come in, for example, to explore the very the daily life of Afghan women. Um, so now coming back to uh, Dr. Uh, Krashenko's remark, uh, yes, I mean, without economic growth and economic activity, uh, the Taliban should not expect uh, to, uh, uh, to be able to uh, collect more revenues in the future. Already in the past two months at least, uh, two months at least, there has been an increase in frustration that, uh, um, and that we see from uh, people in the private sector, not only just uh, small businesses and informal merchants uh, expressing their frustration, uh, about uh, the tax collection, which are completely um, uh, repressive, actually a very repressive system, but also larger businesses have, um, you know, we do have contacts with some large businesses and we are, they're also expressing their frustration. And I think if this continues on with the fact that the Taliban are now have grown their military expenses and so forth, it's going to be very difficult for them to keep up with uh, tax collection. And this will further depress economic growth. That's true. Um, if I add uh, to, in addition to what has already been said, uh, 
Um, I think part of the press frustration that uh, Ms. Rona Karimi mentioned is, um, um, so first of all, to add that our survey is much longer. So what you saw in the presentation is a number of the metrics. So if you go and see the full survey, there are over 100 questions that we've asked. So we had to drop some of those questions. Uh, things like visiting a doctor, you know, um, smoking, seeing a psychiatrist, uh, how, um, and so on. Um, but you also have to understand that it is important to present data in a neutral manner, in a scientific way that provides evidence and informs and raises awareness. I think it's very important that we understand the power of, you know, statistics and first-hand primary surveys and what it shows. Uh, specifically on the mental health crisis of Afghan women and girls, there is another survey that was done, I think, by an organization called DROPS and ODI. Uh, another socioeconomic um, survey that was recently released is by UNDP. So you have all of these surveys emerging and they all point in the same direction. So the anticipation is that policymakers and people in positions of power and those who can influence the trend of things in, in Afghanistan would take heed of these findings and these surveys and uh, make change. Um, like um, Dr. Krushenko said, you know, there is a division of labor. So uh, it is also important not to undermine the importance of providing this evidence, you know, first-hand evidence. This so, really colleagues, there's a, there's a, we're going to be running out of time shortly. There's a question from Omario Kanji, and he says, thank you very much, Professors Joy and Rahimi, for this uh, very insightful presentation. Question, for those who said they would lead definitely want to leave Afghanistan. Is there any information collected or gleaned as to where they would choose to go? Is it even feasible for anybody to simply leave today? Uh, yes, should, should I pick this up? Um, we didn't ask um, specifically, where would you go? Um, I think um, currently, uh, people are able to go to Iran and partially to Pakistan, but I think the situation in Pakistan is ever evolving and changing and the dynamics are changing so much. Um, so I think Iran is one of the only places that m mostly people go. I I'm not very aware of you know, the destinations, um, but um, that question specifically wasn't asked as part of the survey. No, but what do you think? I mean, you can go to Pakistan and then get stuck there or go to Iran and get stuck there. Isn't that the case? Um, to be honest, um, the number of different global events, I would say, um, kind of shifted the focus away from Afghanistan and the trend and the rapidness of, you know, these reloc relocations that were happening in the first year uh, after the collapse. And uh, it's also natural, you know, as slowly you move away, kind of the attention m moves to other things. So it is true that in the first year after the collapse, there were a number of different relocations to various places like uh, the US, Canada, Europe, uh, with various different degrees, you know, some countries making more of an effort, uh, some less. Um, but that has slowed down, yes. Okay, colleagues, if there uh, are no more questions or um, when nobody wants to pick up their hand, um, uh, I thank uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Joya and Dr. Rahimi for this presentation. You can read the whole paper on the uh, Biruni website. Uh, we will, we have an uh, ARI has a newsletter where we will be uh, providing information on where all of these publications are going to be uh, available, where uh, available. And I understand, Omar, uh, that you guys are also working on an article based on, on this thing, right? Uh, 
But if you go on the Biruni, the Biruni website, you'll find the, uh, the this article is available there. Thank you very much for participating. We really appreciate your participation. We will have a um, web webinar, uh, public lecture next next month that will be dealing with Afghan futures, and it will be hosted by Professor. It will be uh, Professor Naimat Ibrahimi from Australia and another speaker from Australia. We'll see what we can do with the time zones. And we hope to do these every single month. Thank you very much for uh, participating and uh, stay tuned and wish everyone all the best. Thanks a lot, Omar and Luthi. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. Very well done. Thanks. Thank you. Oh, there are two new messages. Hold on. I am looking forward to the, hearing the Afghan future once again. Very, very good. Great. Thanks, guys. Bye bye. Take care. Bye.